Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to Let Them Talk here at the uh, French Quarter Festival. Our interview series uh, continues with a trombone panel and uh, great uh, three great trombonists who have uh, brought that instrument uh, to bear here in the uh, second century of jazz and other related musics in New Orleans. Uh, our thanks uh, to the French Quarter Festival and to the New Orleans Jazz National Historical Park, to the National Park Service, the uh, Louisiana State Museum folks, and to the Midlow uh, Center at UNO, the Hogan Jazz Archive at Tulane, all helping make these uh, series of conversations possible. I'm Fred Casson, and uh, I'm joined today by Delphio Marcellus, by Craig Klein, and by Mark Mullins. <laughs> these guys are, are uh, all uh, very good sack butt players. <laughs> or uh, as it became to be known in the uh, in the 18th century, the trombone. Actually, uh, it's a uh, trombone is an Italian uh, combination of Italian words. Trom means uh, trumpet and one trombone, uh, big trumpet. But it's uh, yeah the slide, and it's a whole lot more than a big trumpet. Uh, it's a very interesting instrument and uh, one that's been an integral part of New Orleans music for for many many years. So I want to just find out uh, from each of them in turn how they got uh, started with the uh, instrument. Delphio, let me start with you. What, what uh, got you playing trombone? Well, a guy came by to school in sixth grade, I think, and uh, saw the instruments. And at that point, Bradford had the saxophone and went and had a trumpet. I said, okay. Yeah, it wasn't really much uh, appeal in that respect. And then I saw the trombone, and I said, man, it doesn't look like anybody sane would want to play this instrument. Because the way it looked real bizarre, you know, and uh, of all the instruments, I said, this one's for me. And uh, that, that was the, the beginning of it. Uh, what was it? Uh, did you like it once you started playing it immediately? Yeah, it was, I don't know if I'd say immediately, because, you know, I wanted to, Branford and one were playing these Earth, Wind, and Fire horn parts. They were the only band in the city that could play the, the Earth, Wind, and Fire horn parts, and they never had a trombone. So I was like, in sixth grade, I was like, man, if I could just get to, you know, play those and you know it, it takes more time than that. So, right, right. But uh, you know, I, I was I was cool with it. Yeah. Finally, and then the year after that, or so they left the house, so I was okay. I said, oh well. <laughs> <laughs> the, you know, the pressure was off. <laughs> uh, Craig, uh, for, where where are you from, Craig? I'm from here in New Orleans. In New yeah. Orleans. And did you, yeah. when did you start playing trombone? Um, my uncle Jerry Dahlman is a trombone player, and you guys, if you've seen the story of Stompers, he's one of the trombone players in that band. He's only six years older than me. So I started just by seeing him play, and uh, my grandmother used to take me to his his little gigs when he was in school. He played in the little jazz band, so I would just watch him, and I wanted to play. So fourth grade, I got his used old trombone. And that's how I started. Yeah. What, what about uh, you? Was that a good experience? I mean, did you uh, start digging it pretty quick? Yeah, I did. The only problem was your arm can't reach out too far. So you <laughs> Seventh really position was a little <laughs> limited at that age. You know? <laughs> It was a couple of years before seventh position was an option. <laughs> yeah. uh, Mark, uh, you're from New Orleans also. I grew up in New Orleans. Um, I guess one of my little closet secrets, one of many, is that uh, I, I was born in New Jersey. and so, But I grew up down here ever since I was four years old. And uh, we had a lot of different kinds of music in our house when I was growing up. But I guess what got me into trombone, my older brothers played in the band. And in school, you know, and so I was like, well, I got to do this. This is this is cool. And I did, I wanted to play saxophone, and they're like, they're like, no, you should play trombone because no nobody wants to play trombone, and you'll be first chair right away. <laughs> and so I was like, well, okay. Uh, and sure enough, like even through high school, like there was like one or two trombone players in the schools that I went to school with, and uh, in the schools that I went to. But um, that's that's primarily how I how I got into it. What was trombone your first instrument? I wanted. I was more interested in saxophone. You know, my brothers, like I said, talked me out of it a little bit. But my orthodontist, also ironically enough, uh, he's like, "Well, no, you're you're about to have braces, so if you play saxophone with the with, with the with the reed and with the way that mouthpiece is biting down, it's not really going to be good to the problem that we're trying to correct." And if it, if I don't know if he's right or wrong, but we we bought it and. Uh, I'm playing trombone now because of that, primarily, too. <laughs> what, what, what about you? Uh, did, did it feel good to you as you, uh, did you like it uh, pretty quickly? Probably, like, maybe all of our experiences, anybody that first plays the trombone, like, 
you, you're kind of amazed by the sounds that you can get, and you you kind of quickly realize that the sounds you can get off of this instrument is can be a lot different than any on, anybody else in the band room, um, and so that was pretty cool. But trying to keep up with the technical proficiency of the trumpets or the saxophone guys in the band quickly became pretty frustrating. And so, <laughs> you know, but yeah, I, from a sonic way and, and trying to figure out, well, wow, this is a weird instrument. How do you make this thing work? Well, yeah, one of the things that um, I always thought it was really great ear training uh, to, to play trombone, or could be if you could, could play in tune, uh, because you, you had to use your ear to, uh, a lot of ways, there's some visual guides too, but not that many to, to find those positions. That's true, that's true. Yeah. Uh, well, Delphio, you, you had been uh, wanting to play those earth, wind, and, and fire horn parts, of, but uh, what else were you listening to as you started playing trombone? Did you begin to listen to trombone players? Yeah, I got a J.J. Johnson record and uh, went and gave me the record. He said, uh, if you learn one of these solos, I'll buy you a new horn. And it was like late J.J. from, it was called Proof Positive. Right. It's like one of the record. premier modern jazz trombone records. And there was no possibility. And that's kind of, you know, where Winton is. He gives you something, he says, he knows it's, it's not possible you're going to learn one of these. <laughs> so, uh, man, I listened to that record. I used to listen at that record. I just learned the whole record. I was like, but they were just... I didn't have the, the facility, so he had one ballad on the record. It was My Funny Valentine. I said, okay, I can learn this one. And uh, But he had a cadenza at the very end, which was just like, I was like, yeah, you can give me a break. I got everything in the <laughs> He does this do 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 yo 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 It's like a diminished thing. So, uh, you know, and that's when I started dabbling in, in electronics and in, in computer work. So what I did was I had uh, two cassettes so I edited out that cadenza, cassette to cassette. <laughs> so uh, I, I called Winton and I said, all right, here it is. And I played along with the record, I played the whole thing. And then of course the cadenza was missing, I played the ending. And I just looked at him and he looked at him and he kind of frowned. I said, what about that horn? He just, well, he walked out, first of all, he didn't say anything. And I never got the horn, so that was <laughs> that. Was that right? <laughs> yeah. I don't know if he knew the record. I don't think he actually did, but I think he might have figured there was some kind of trickery going on. Because uh, if, he, if he thought that there was any possibility that I would have actually been able to learn one, he never would have offered it up. You know? so, uh, but that was you know, primarily it. And then uh, uh, when I got to high school, I became more interested in, in orchestral playing and classical playing. So I spent a lot of time uh, with the orchestral music. and. If really, that's where my sound is. Uh, it comes out of that experience more mm -hmm. so, I think. But was that uh, in, in school orchestra? Uh, in school orchestra, and just uh, I went to NOCA, and I just studied, you know, some of the repertoire of uh, the guys that were playing Christian Lindbergh and Brandon Marshall and mm -hmm. Joel S. It's different guys. Um, and then I heard uh, Slide Hampton actually put out the world of trombones. Right when I was early in high school, and that was one of the, the pivotal moments to hear a group of trombone players playing, and man, they were cooking. And uh, I was actually was able to meet Slide not long after that, and it was is inspirational to hear, you know, guys are playing like Donna Lee fast and all these harmonizations and right. things going on. So uh, that was what about eight trombones? Or? It was yeah, seemed like it was eight or ten. Yeah, so, I, yeah, so I heard it once in New York, man. It was a powerful, eight, powerful sound. And uh, so, you know, but it, it was a collection of all of that to say that was what I maybe had at home. But of course, being in New Orleans, you would always hear the bands playing. And right. I heard Freddie Lonzo and Lucian Barbaran and Frog Joseph. And these guys were really playing to hear that live. And they're playing with power and so much relaxation and melody. And they just, man, it was just, it was just breezing through these tunes. And I was like, man, what is going on here? So, you know, from every angle, I had the modern, uh, trombone that I was hearing on the recordings and then you have the traditional New Orleans sounds of these guys where they're tearing it up and then the orchestra that I'm learning in school so it all kind of came together. Mm -hmm. Well I mentioned JJ of course I guess uh, any discussion of trom trombonist uh, since he came along would include that but I remember very well where I first heard Mark Mullins and it was at a uh, master class JJ was conducting at uh, Loyola. All right. Yeah yeah I at Loyola University, he was one of the he was a guest on one of the years that, that I was there, and, and John Mahoney told me he was bringing in J.J. Johnson this year for the for the jazz for the Loyola Jazz Fest. I just couldn't believe it. We were all uh, we were all just losing our mind, and so I, I got to pick him up from the airport, 
and, and you know, I'm just asking him a thousand questions a second, you know, and, and he's just so calm and he was so casual, smiling and, and just the answers he was giving me were so logical, down to earth, simple and nothing what I was looking for. But like, when you look back on it, it's like totally the right answers. Like, well, I, like college guy asking a question, like, how many hours a day do you practice, JJ? <laughs> you know, and this is a guy, he's a legend now. I mean, and he's like, well, and without saying he doesn't practice as much as he used to because he doesn't really need to or whatever, he says, well, it's more like you have the horn sitting there in your house and you just kind of touch base with it from time to time. So it was like real vague, you know, like, is that like once a week or is that, you know, <laughs> so, let's see, so how do I incorporate that wisdom into what I'm trying to do now. I just totally didn't relate, but um, yeah, it was that was amazing having him there for a couple of days just to rub elbows with him and, and listen to him, see him rehearse with the big band. It was amazing. And then he invited uh, you and uh, maybe a few other players on stage to uh, to play a little bit. We did, yeah, we did, we did. See. He played with the big band, and I think we also might have played with him uh, at, at the master class. Right, right. Yeah, that was exciting. exciting. Yeah, it was. I, I remember hearing you play and saying, "I think we'll be hearing more from this guy." Oh, thanks. Yeah. Uh, Craig, you had your uncle's uh, strong influence. What other things were kind of out there you were looking at as you were learning to play a little bit? Um, I I didn't really study trombone so much. Um, in high school, we started hanging around a French Quarter. You, you know, you had fake IDs and you go to Pat O'Brien's. And <laughs> one time when I went to Pat O's, I heard this music coming out of this place next door to it. And it was Preservation Hall, and I was probably 16 years old, and I went and got my hurricane, and I went back to Pat O'Brien's and, and heard this amazing traditional New Orleans music with Lewis Nelson and the Humphrey Brothers. Uh, it, was, it just opened my eyes and my ears up to something that I never really had a, a grasp on. So every time when my friends would want to come to, to the French Court, I would I'll always go get my hurricane and go to Preservation Hall and they would stay there. They weren't so interested in, in going to hear this music. And Frog Joseph, I would probably, as Delphio mentioned, he was probably one of my favorite guys to, to listen to. He just played those perfect notes in the right places. And I, I thought, that's, that's really good. That makes, me feel, that makes me feel what he's doing. So I kind of thought, I want to follow and listen to him as much as I possibly could. And I just kind of started there. And then coming into... Um, Learning, following the brass bands around. I used to follow the Olympia Brass Band way back in the early 80s. And um, I, I was interested in the brass band music also. So I, just by being around those guys, I started um, this band. Well, I didn't start the band, but the band, <laughs> it's called the Storyville Stompers Brass Band. And it's been together for 30 years. And um, we've, we've uh, you know, a lot of the original members in the band. And it's been... Um, quite an experience to, I didn't, the classical music was just, I couldn't under, I, it was just too too complicated for me. I wanted to, you know, so I didn't, I didn't really, it, it takes us a, a different brain level to kind of go that way. I was interested in more of the, the New Orleans stuff, like right off the bat, the gut bucket things that, so that's kind of where. Is your book gut bucket, man? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah. w were you in the, in school bands? Uh? I was in the high school band, right? I was in a high school band at East Jefferson High School, and um, we had a we had a good we had a jazz band and a good music program that kind of got us got at least got me interested in hearing other music. And you know, when we talk about trombone players, I would have to say JJ, and I thought I think probably all of us would agree that if you could pick you know somebody to put on top, JJ Johnson was I would have to say is one of the most important musicians because he, he could do it all. He could play, you know, all of those perfect things, those cadenzas that, yeah. you know, it's hard to even think about or just those nice slow blues things. And um, But then, as, you know, you can go down from there. I, I listen to a lot of, you know, when you talk about Earth, Wind, and Fire, and I like those those kind of, that, all that stuff. And um, Chicago. Chicago, yeah. yeah you you know, know, high D. Sorry. Well, Delphio, did you did you play in uh, like uh, in, in some funk or, or uh, rhythm and blues rock? No. Or, 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 well, you know, Branford and Wynton got all of the fun, man. They just broke wild. 
<laughs> and then uh, I have a brother Ellis who was a year older than me, and we hung out. And my my mom just put the clamps down. She was like, "That's it." <laughs> so here I went. <laughs> oh, mom. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so between that and the fact that the DJs were taking over, right? You know, early '80s, right? Late yeah. '70s. And it was just, you didn't have the opportunity. Not so much. Yeah, we find it. It's actually, to me, it's coming back around because now you have much more live music and much more opportunity to play live music than what I recall they had at that era, at that particular time, you know. So it's kind of turning around from the whole DJ experience and people only wanting that now, especially here in New Orleans, people want to hear live music. Yeah, it seems in some ways there's there's more live music than there's been uh, in my experience in New Orleans, uh, uh, which is about 30 years now. This may be as, as much as I've ever seen. Yeah, yeah I think it's a combination of uh, definitely Hurricane Katrina, the things that, that happened after that, and just making an awareness. You know, people becoming aware that, wow, you know, this music doesn't have to be here. This city doesn't actually have to be here. So that kind of piqued the interest. And then, of course, with Treme, and the, right. the music that, that they've been able to feature. It's, uh, it's, I mean, so many things have helped out. I think though, this year, next year is gonna be the year of the trombone, you know, cause you know, in addition to, you know, Bonarama and me being out there, trombone shorty, right. who's on the poster of the Jazz Fest, Big Sam Williams, and you know, uh, as we said, Freddie Lonzo, Lucian Barber, and they're going strong. Yeah. So it's like it's like a lot of trom trombones was happening. A lot of really good trombones players. Yeah, yeah there there's are. a lot of good stuff with the trombone. Yeah. I think New Orleans has always been a trombone town. When you look back on it, and there's been a lot of great. I mean, you always think trumpet players because Louis Armstrong and you know Wint and all of these great trumpet players. But if you dig a little deeper, it's it's a trombone town as much as uh, as a trumpet town. Kid Ory and you know Frog and. Oh yeah, I used to love to listen to uh, Placid Adams had uh, Frog Joseph and Ralph Johnson on sax, yeah. Jack Willis on cornet. Oh yeah, yeah. and that was that was a great. They, they held court at the uh, Hilton uh, Sunday brunch for right. eight years. Sure. That was always a lot of fun. What Mark? What about in high school before Loyola? Were you playing in bands? Uh, yeah, I, towards the end of high school, I got involved with the with the band. But you know, it's funny you talk. We talk about J.J. Johnson. He he's probably influenced more trombone players than any other trombone player. But I didn't. I didn't really know who JJ was until until late high school, and I was. I started playing trombone when I was eight, I think. So, um, but yeah, at our house we had a lot of rock music, so I knew who Chicago was, and I knew like, wow, that's trombone in that band. And I, I learned about Jimmy Pankow, and I actually used to study his arrangements and pick out how he would arrange horns for that kind of music with the trombone because there. You know, I was, I was as a trom young trombone player, not uh, knowledgeable about JJ at the time, or any uh, any other jazz f for that matter. I was, I was searching for stuff. Um, my dad had these these records too, uh, these Dixieland records, Dukes of Dixieland, like the original Dukes of Dixieland with the with the Asunto brothers, uh, and you know Fred Asunto on trombone and his dad Papa Jack, and uh, I didn't you know. I thought that was great sound of music, and I listened to it back today. And I didn't know anything about traditional music or about Dixieland or whether there was a difference or what the difference was. I just knew it was some records I had in my house that had a trombone guy on it that was just wailing, and I wanted to try to figure out what he was doing. So I, I, that's the only jazz I had at an early age. And like in seventh grade, I remember sitting in my room trying to write out Fred Asunto's solos and. I wasn't tra I was transcribing them, but I wasn't doing it the right way. I was just writing little letters on the page and little little sketches, just so I would know when I'd read it, like how to do it. And I'd get so mad that I couldn't play that stuff. I would, my older brother would say, "Don't worry, man. Just play it slow and take it easy. You'll get it one day." And, and I said, "It's never gonna happen." But um, I just kept at it and kept at it. And but that that's the kind of music. Uh, they, I had, we had Dixieland records in my house, and we had. Led Zeppelin and you know <laughs> Chicago and stuff and playing along with as, as crazy as it sounds, uh, Clarence Clemens solos on Bruce Springsteen. Anything to figure out how to make this work in the kind of music I was listening to. So, mm -hmm. uh, what about uh, Ed Loyal? Then you, you got a little more into jazz or begin listening more to it? Absolutely, um, the whole world opened up at that point and. I learned who Carl Fontana was, and Carl Fontana is another yes. just amazing innovator on the trombone that took the trombone into places that hadn't really been taken before. And going backwards from him, like you know, I learned 
later in high school, Jack Teagarden was, and Miff Mole, and all these other guys that I just, they weren't household names uh, when you're a 12, 13 year old trombone player, you, you know, necessarily, you might not know who those people are. And so it was amazing and, and eye opening to, to, to hear these guys and realize, my God, this instrument is not limited by technical or, or you know, proficiency or anything. When these guys, you can do a lot of stuff on this instrument. So it was, it was amazing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, throughout Loyola, definitely to study jazz and all that. Yeah. Uh, Delphio, when, when did you start playing uh, trombone outside of uh, orchestral uh, things and school things? What do you mean? I mean, uh, professionally, uh, first uh, first experience as a oh, I professional. Think the, the World's Fair came in 84, and there was like gigs everywhere. Mm -hmm. I remember, you know, they were looking for bands, so I put together a band and just started playing. Actually, in, in, in high school, because uh, Harry Connick Jr. was in a couple of grades below me, and uh, we had a band called Dr. Delph and the Killer Groove. <laughs> 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 and, uh, Harry, well, you know, he's, he's kind of out there, you know, it was his, uh, his whole idea, it was, you know, pretty much his band, he put the band together. How he came up on that name, I don't actually know. We had t-shirts, he had the t-shirts made, Dr. Delph and the Keller Groove on the back. And I think we had one gig, we knew three songs, <laughs> and we did one gig somewhere and that was it. I think after that one gig, it was like, uh, we, we got to come up with something else. You know, it was supposed to be a funk band, and I, I guess that wasn't really our call. Well, it's, uh, the, the name advanced a little from your dad to the Groovy Boys, <laughs> which was, I think, one of his first bands. That might have been where he got the, yeah, Dr. Dell. Oh, well, the, uh, uh, and uh, so you played mostly funk repertoire? Or? Like, we, we just had three songs. Again, it was just Harry was just, if you know Harry, he's, he's like right. really, he's right. got a lot of energy, and he just, at that age, you know, you can imagine that. He would just come like, yeah, man, let me check out this tune, man. Hey, man, check out this chord, man. Yeah, we're gonna play this tune. Look, so look, man, let's run this tune. Yeah, I got it, man. I got it. You just play this. Okay, yeah, yeah. I'm just like, okay, okay, Harry. It's, it's gonna be cool, man. Okay. But you know, I was in high school, so whatever. He, right, he right. said he, his dad had hooked up some gig somewhere. I don't even remember where. And yeah. We had, he just got the, the folks together and we went and played. And uh, mm -hmm. I don't remember any of the music. It was right. something. Well, did did you study music in college? I did. That's really when I started playing jazz because I got to Berkeley College of Music and uh, I was actually going to go to, I wanted to go to Eastman, mm -hmm. but uh, I was in the McDonald's band and some of the guys, they were like, ah, man, you don't want to play that classical junk, man, come on, come to Berkeley. And I'm like, oh, okay, well, so I went to, I called Branford, had gone to Berkeley, so I called Branford and Branford was like, he's a couple of years older, so he never would talk to us really. He was just like always off on his own, so I called him up, I was like, hey, man, you know, what about Berkeley? So he said, I'll call you back. <laughs> so he called me back and then he says, okay, write these numbers down. So he called everybody he knew. I said, look, my little brother's coming up there. So I went up there at Berkeley and, you know, stayed at, you know, this guy's house, Walter Beasley. I'm sleeping on his sofa. And I went to financial aid and I said, you know, hey, I, I, I want to come to school here. And so the woman looks at me, she says, well, uh, how are you going to pay for it? So I said, this is financial aid. You're supposed to tell me. <laughs> Sharon Bridges, I remember she looked at me. She said, hold on. She went in the back to talk to some people. <laughs> she was like, this, this guy is either crazy or, so they, I guess Branford had called them. She talked to the right people. Now. So at any rate, I ended up at Berkeley and um, the guys were really playing. They had guys playing, you know, uh, really the guys that had, uh, Donald Harrison had just left, but the guys that were in school with Branford and Don, a lot of them were still there. Uh, well, you wouldn't know any of their names, but hearing them inspired me. Terry Connolly was on piano, uh, Ron Savage was on drums, there's a guy named Bud Rebels, and you go in the club and these cats are playing like Cherokee through all of the keys, like right. up there, like, you know, the guys were walking the bass on the, so it was really inspiration. I said, man, I, I was like, give me some Mahler. I want some Beethoven, I don't want to deal with this. But, but they, they knew Branford and some of them knew went so they kind of pressured me into playing jazz. They were like, no, you're going to be. So they they looked after me and I learned about Vic Dickinson and J.C. Higginbotham right. and, you know, Al Gray. and So I just, I just really learned about, and the, the library was really extensive, so I, I learned very quickly. So then when guys would come up to me and say, yeah, man, I'm checking out some Dexter Gordon. I said, oh, yeah, man, that's it. I'd be like, Dexter Gordon, okay. <laughs> I'd go to the library and be like, Dexter Gordon. <laughs> so, uh, you know, Berkeley was where I put, you know, put a lot of it together and was around a lot of different guys that were really serious about playing. 
Well, you were also very interested in the uh, production side as well. Didn't you study some of that there too? Yeah, and that was another part that uh, Don Palouse, who had engineered one of Witten's early records, had started the music production and engineering department. And uh, they, we did, they changed like all of the rules to the program after me and a guy named Patrick Smith left because we broke every single rule. <laughs> We just went in and you couldn't work on professional projects, but like two or three of Branford's first records were all edited there. And you know, we just did any, you know, we were in college, right? We were like, whatever. Right. And they used to have like a sign out sheet where you'd have to sign out, and you can only sign out, I think, 30 or 45 minutes at a time. So we were like, what if people just don't show up? <laughs> so we would sign us, my name, and then it would be somebody else, Robert Johnson, and then it would be, you know, they had a, a fair amount of, of Japanese students, so it would be, we were like, they can't know all of them, Hideki, Matsui, or whoever, you know, we just make up these names, so the, the teacher would come in and be like, y'all have been in here for three hours. I said, well, uh, Hideki didn't show up. <laughs> and then finally they were like, we don't even have a Hideki in the program. <laughs> so, so at any rate, though, yeah, Berkeley was, it was a great time, you know, just to, the college days, but I loved them. It helped you get to your playing together and also get a lot of experience in that production side. Yeah, I think the most important part, though, is the, is the competition of it. And when mm -hmm. we mentioned, you know, of course, we mentioned J.J., but the reality for J.J. is, you know, he had to deal with Al Gray. Right. And he had to deal with a lot of the, the older generation of Lawrence Brown and these guys in Duke Ellington's band. And uh, that's what's important for us today is to be able to hear, you know, as I said, all the trombone players in the city and that inspires you to not only come up with your own thing, but you got to be on top of your game. You're right. Yeah. yeah. So that was the, the the great part about college is just being around. You know, Rod Hargrove came in, right. and Tony O'Hart, and all these, and it was a collection of people, and that that's just a very small amount though. You right. Know, you got to figure, not several thousand people in the school. There was probably maybe fifteen or twenty trombone. guys that really wanted to play. I mean, just wanted to play jazz. Oh right. Not on trombone. We might have had maybe three guys, oh, sorry. You know, but it's just the fact that you have, you know, everybody concentrated that's really trying to play, it's, it's inspirational, it, mm -hmm. it, you know, helps you to really strive for and to achieve things. Yeah. Uh, Craig, what, what about uh, your professional experience? When did you start playing uh, for well, the big bucks? I went to Loyola, I graduated high school in 1978, and I went to Loyola for one semester, and I didn't even finish that semester majoring in music. It was just, I don't know, it was a little bit more, I was, I wanted to chase girls and not practice and, you know, they had the, the old buildings on the corner, the three old Victorians, right. and the practice rooms were downstairs and all these guys would be down there practicing all day long, and I, I guess I wasn't that motivated at that time, so I went to a school in Hammond called Southeastern Louisiana University, and I got a degree in marketing. But I, I was playing music here. I was driving back and playing. I had I was in this uh, like a cover band, and we would play Wednesday night, Friday night, and Saturday night in Fat City. It was a regular gig at this place called the Place. And we made thirty three dollars a night, and I would drive in from Hammond to to make this gig just because it wasn't about the money. I just wanted to play. Um, and then from there, my uncle Jerry, he was also in another band. He kind of hooked me up into that band. There was this group that used to, they would meet at the Dream Palace, which is on Frenchman Street, is now on the Blue Nile. And a group was called the Paradise Tumblers, and they would have these, they called them tumbles. And it was like a brass band, but it was more like a spasm band, because most of the people couldn't really play, they just taught themselves a couple of songs on the instruments. But then other musicians started filtering in, just because it was fun. There's no money, it was just about meeting there, drinking a little bit and parading through the French Quarter, just playing some songs. And I started doing that. And then from there, that's when the Storyville Stompers came out of that. And I just, um, I just kind of just started playing around. So I don't, my, my music education is not so formal. I, um, I tried to, I said, I'm gonna transcribe. I, I had never studied how to transcribe solos or anything. And I said, I'm gonna, transcribe this, uh, try to transcribe a J.J. Johnson solo, and it was, uh, I forget what song it was, it was a blues, and he starts out with this nice easy triplet figure, do, 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 do. I got that pretty good, you know, and then the second 12 bars, he got a little bit more, and I put the pencil down, I said, I can't do this, I'm, you know, I couldn't, I couldn't, <laughs> it was beyond what I, what I could, you know, try to do, so I, I guess, um, my thing was just being around New Orleans and just trying to fit in 
where I thought I could fit in. Yeah. Mark, what about you? When did you get started playing uh, professionally? Um, I think the first thing I remember doing was when I was like 12 or 13, me and my buddies from school put this little band together. Like a, it, was like a, it was like a Dixieland band, you know? And, and uh, we were like, man, wouldn't it be cool to be like one of those guys in the, in the parade, and on, like on the truck, you know, that rides by? And like, we like going to parades, but man, that, we, played, we played in the band at school, that's all right. But like, we wanted to be, we wanted to be in front of people. Like, that would be awesome, all those people at the parade, and you're playing for all these people. So I begged my band director to give me a list of the parade captains that she had, <laughs> and she did. And so I said, guys, look, we'll, we'll try, we'll try this one, we'll try this one, and this one, and we'll, we'll just, we'll, I'll call. Them. I said, I'll call. Them. <laughs> so I got, I was so nervous. I was so nervous. I, I remember distinctly exactly where I was in my parents' house when I picked up the phone, looking at their names, and I had this little thing written out, you know. My name is Mark Mullins, and I have a band, and my voice is shaking. I'm just terrified. And uh, and I said, we go to the school, and she's like, okay. Um, real stern, like parade captain. Um, all right, I'll, we'll think about that. Um, what's your fee? I was like, um, and I was like, we didn't talk about this with the guys. We actually might get paid. You know? uh, $75, I said, I just made it up. Like, for the whole band? Yeah. And then she was like, okay, it's good, it's yeah. done, you, you got it. I was like, yeah. wow, we got a gig, man. I called the guys right away, we were so fired up, man, we got a gig. And, uh, and then, Joe, of course, one of the guys in the band, maybe we should ask for a little more <laughs> before you call the second guy. I was like, I don't know, I mean, so I, was there. I called Thor, I think, McKinley Cantrell, I remember his name. And I uh, picked up the phone, still scared to death, called him, did the same thing. And this time I was waiting, well, what's your fee? It's like, a hundred dollars. <laughs> and he's like, all right, cool. I was like, guys, we got two gigs. <laughs> so we did a few of those, like, I think being in Thor, I remember it rained the whole time. It was like, you know, we, the excitement of getting the gig quickly wore off. You know, we're sitting there in the pouring down rain, lightning falling down around us, and we're on the top of a float. Got this float paint all over our Dixieland band's uniform, white pants. That was real smart. And, uh, anyway, but that was some of my earlier stuff that, that I remember doing. When did you and uh, uh, Craig meet? You know, I, I always try to right, remember Loyola. exactly when we first met each other. I don't know. Well, you know what? I used to see you playing at Storyville with was it Luther King? With um, with Robert Charles Gable Brett? from Robert, Luther, yeah, yeah, the little uh, the little the, the house band thing right. we had there. Because we would play at Molly's at the Market, and y'all were at Storyville. Right. So that's when I first started. But he was a student at Loyola. We just kind of met that way. Yeah. Well, and, and Craig went to school with my older brother, Doug. Yeah. So I would see you at those EJ concerts, uh, East Jefferson concerts. Prof. Right. Well, so yeah, probably 80s. Yeah. yeah. And, and when did the idea of Bonorama first come, come to you guys? Well, Mark and I started playing with Harry Connick Jr. in 1990. And we, we were, Harry would go and he, we would tour a lot and then he would go and do a movie. We'd be off a lot. So there's a lot of downtime. And one of the times we spent a lot of time in New York City, and one of the um, nights, one of, uh, it was Monday night, and it was a club called the Village Gate, and every Monday was salsa meets jazz, and uh, one of the guys in the band, Dave Schumacher, said, "You got to go down and hear this salsa band. I think it was Manny or Ortegas or something like that." He said, "It's got five trombones, Cuban band," and I went down there. It was Ronnie Cuba on baritone sax, featured with this Cuban band with five trombones. And I walked in, and it was just this wall of, of sound, and it just it floored me. I was I was amazed, and I was just mesmerized by this this whole sound of the of the bones coming at you with this band, you know, pumping underneath it. And I thought, I want to put a New Orleans band together that features the trombone. And um, I went back and talked to Mark. I said, let's let's you know, here's an idea, and he was all about it. And next thing you know, he had arrangements written for all. He says, "Look, I got these, you know, these songs. We can try this." And then um, I guess that was '97 or '98 or so. Yeah, I, I was lucky enough. I had this night at Tipitina's French Quarter that, for some weird reason, they asked me to do a night every third, every other Wednesday, and it could be anything I wanted. And uh, 
And so I bring in different people and different combinations of people. And, and Craig came to me with this idea right around that time. And I'm like, well, man, we could just do it on one of these nights. It would be like something fun we could do in our off time, you know. And I, we had Freddie. Who, who all did we have in the first? Oh, we, we had, had about Freddie. And Freddie. We had Lucian. Yep. How come you weren't there? I don't know. Yeah. yeah. Why well, wasn't that there? Come on, bro. <laughs> Tell me. Hey, man. Was I was out of town. That's it. Come on. Yeah. You, you, I don't think you were living. I was out of town. Yeah, yeah. 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 It's Steve cool, Suda, Brian O'Neill, and um, the first gig we did was at the Tipitinas yeah. that Mark did. That was, it was fun. That, was, that would be 98. Yeah. 98. Yeah. We probably had 15 trombone players show up that night. I'll never forget. We were all, it was loud. It was rocking, you know. And, and Freddie Lonzo, who's probably the loudest trombone player, he, we were all playing in microphones. And Freddie stood up on the drum riser, and he was playing over, and it, his sound was just over the other 12 trombone players. That was, I can just remember looking back at Freddie, and he was playing so hard and so loud. It was unbelievable. Unreal. Yeah. That must have been uh, very uh, just great, great to hear. And I mean, from you guys, uh, it, it must have been exciting from the start to think about that. It was. It, it, it kind of sensed something from the crowd, you know, that was different than other gigs that we would play with different people as well. Just um, we didn't mean for it to be different necessarily. We were just putting friends together, trying to do something fun with the trombone, and like, but we quickly kind of realized that the way it was perceived was that oh this is something really unique and different and it's mistakenly perceived that it's something that's never been done before because there's been trombone groups for you know Slide Hampton like we just mentioned I mean there's countless uh, you know Brazilian music there's there, I mean there's so many examples of, of that so but here locally you know it, it was maybe a little bit different I guess uh, but it was fun to see that we didn't expect the perception to be quite like that positive. Right. Well, 14 years later, it's still happening. Yeah. yeah. And Mark is still calling those people and uh, asking for a little, a little bit more than $100. Yes, sir. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we could use you for 75 I don't know about that. <laughs> we'll do it. Delphio, you, you've had uh, together for a few years now the Uptown Jazz Orchestra, mm -hmm. which is a great, great big band. What got you, I mean, yeah. what kind of a crazy mood hit you to start a big band? Well, let me just say I played with, uh, it was a, I played a big band gig. Somebody called me and it was a collection band that they put together and it just wasn't really happening. And it was a concern of mine that a lot of the students, some of the students had come out of college and they really had no idea. Now they could read the notes, right? but just the spirit of the music was just, it just really, it didn't make me feel good on the gig, you know? And I said, man, I can't, I didn't know, this is the end. So this was 97 and 98. I said, that's just when I'm gonna start it. And uh, that year we did the uh, Ellington's Nutcracker. All right. And usually when people do the Nutcracker down here, they'll call like two or three rehearsals, you know, and it, whatever the, the pay is. But it's no way to really get the music. And you got guys who maybe have been playing it and if they've been making mistakes for 10 years, they're gonna make the same mistakes. I think we, we rehearsed for that concert for three months. We rehearsed every week, sometimes two or three times. And some of the guys were like, man, you know, why don't you just get guys that can read and such? And I was like, man, it's got the, it's got the, it don't mean a thing if it ain't got that swing. I'm like, so, so, but the great story about that is Roger Lewis. Now, Roger Lewis just turned 70. And Roger's not a strong reader at all, like reading music. He does so much other great stuff right. that he brings energy and excitement, but he doesn't really read very well. Roger Lewis had to have practiced that music three to four hours a day for one month. Mm -hmm. So some of the guys that I hired at the time, they were like, man, you know, you got this guy, he doesn't read, blah, 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 blah. So the day, two days before the concert, we had a rehearsal and Roger Lewis was nailing all of these parts. Because, you know, he had put the record on. And Listen, I've never seen that, that type of diligence from, yeah. you know, a man in his 60s mm -hmm. to really want to play it. And... We, we played it at the, the concert, and we, I mean at the, at the rehearsal, and I looked at the, the guys, you know, they knew who they were that were talking negatively. I didn't say anything, but I looked at them. Mm, no, which was like, when are you gonna do that? Yeah. Would you like so, to retract those statements? Yeah. So, but you know, the idea of the Uptown Jazz, and, and Craig played with us when we did the, the first year at the, the festival, 
a couple years ago, but the idea is that we bring the older musicians, we bring the younger musicians, we bring the guys who can read, the guys who don't really read so well, the guys who play traditional. Like I, my, my really thing that I really want to be able to do is to play a concert of music that involves music from almost every decade so that we can play the, the early traditional New Orleans music, we can play some swing music that's killing, we can play some bebop, then we can go to the modern thing, and then we go to the funk. Like that's really where we're, we're going toward that. And it's taken us a number of years, but the guys, I think they finally, they get it. It's the idea of getting a small group sound out of a big band, where everybody has a responsibility. You know what I mean? As opposed to, you play in a big band, a lot of times a guy gives you the charts, you play your part, but it's like, it's taken me a long time to get these guys to get used to, look man, you're responsible. It's not just me yeah. dictating, but uh, so that's kind of, that was how it started and it's it's grown into, I'm gonna call you Cal, we get uh, you cats I was on. gonna ask why, but. Uh, yeah, well, you know, I was returning a favor. <laughs> <laughs> I always like playing, I enjoy playing in the, in the Uptown Jazz Orchestra. Delphio's a good leader, you know, he, he doesn't, he, he does, I mean, he just kind of looks at you and makes you kind of feel like you should be doing a better job. Than that. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's a good time. But, I, and, you know, like having Roger Lewis, it's, it's <clears throat> and the way the band is designed, it just depends on who's there. Right. Because if you have Roger Lewis, you know, it just depends. If you have somebody that really is a, a great uh, traditional player as opposed to who plays more modern, and I just try to spread it around, and uh, it, it's, I, I really love it now. It's been no, it's time a great band, when man. I didn't love it, and the guys knew. I would come in and I was always, you know, cussing after the gig, and man, blah, 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 blah. and I know the guys in the band were just like, boy, how long is this gonna go on? <laughs> but what actually happened was I left town, and there's one guy in the band, Terrence Tappen, who's another trombone player, and he's like the only guy I could rely on to introduce the, the members of the band to remember all the names. So uh, <laughs> I said, look, Tappen, you, you take over the gig. So uh, he did the gig and I came back in town and all the guys in the band are saying, yeah, Tap got you. Tap got you. I said, well, you, yeah, man, you're going to see what it is. But his way of, of introducing the musicians and everything to the audience, it was really a lot more positive. And it was because I would always be thinking about the mistakes. So when I'm introducing guys, I'm just thinking, but if this guy doesn't read this part right, I'm thinking about the other guy to see if this guy doesn't, if he solos too long again. But, uh, you know, it's one of those things where, and I'm constantly learning from the guys, you know, in the band. And uh, Taplin, he did get, I had to tell him, I said, yeah, man. You're not getting a raise, but you got me. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing extra in your pay slip, but uh, thanks nonetheless. Right? Well, it's a great band, uh, and your your small groups are always sounding great too. Always a, a, a joy to hear, it, as is Bonarama and everything you guys playing. Ladies and gentlemen, Delphio Marcellus, Craig Klein, Mark Mullins, three great boys from there.